Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, so the best laid plans, <clears throat> the best laid plans. Um, we wanted to show like the absolute state of the art in how you um, uh, can essentially automate everything in the data center. Uh, and we wanted to show that running on OCP hardware. And the fatal flaw in the plan was it, it takes quite a long time for the switches to boot. So we have been waiting for the switches to boot, but I believe we're now up and running and good to go. Luke? All right, OK. So one of the fun experiences that uh, I've had in the last couple of years has been going into existing data center operations and uh, at short notice having to build out complicated infrastructure, right? So build an OpenStack, build a Kubernetes, build a big data cluster, and so on. And it's very, very interesting you know, when you go inside an operation because the, like the, the reality of the that will calm down. It's just a little anxious because it's booting. Um, the reality of the, um, the average data center is kind of immediately manifest to you, right? And it is a reality which is kind of a mixture of uh, different generations of technology, different generations of projects. That's just how a lot of enterprise data centers um, are. And what we find every single time is that the biggest obstacle to actually standing up something new and exciting is all of the footprints of history, right? All of the um, uh, switch configurations that got created by somebody as part of a project and now have to be cleaned up. All of the um, anecdotal configuration elements that are live in somebody's data center. And so that's really, really pushed to the foreground the idea that to, to move fast with this new wave of software and innovation, we have to get to a world where there's absolutely no manual configuration of any kind of infrastructure element at all, right? So we want to get to a world where, like the web works, the internet works, there we go, great. And we want to get to a world where there's zero manual configuration. And we want that to be true in these two completely opposite domains, right? Which OCP is, I think, going to be relevant for both of them. In the, on the one hand, everything that's happening in a data center where you have this elasticity as a primitive, uh, automation, scale, those are all sort of properties of the data center, but also increasingly at the edge, right? Um, all of those, uh, if you're a telco, GSM radio towers, if you're an enterprise, radio access network, Wi-Fi access points, desk phones, all of that stuff essentially, we want, to, we want to be programming all of that automatically. We don't want any sort of human involvement in setting anything up. So that's kind of the, 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 the mission that we've set ourselves. And the, the stuff I'll be walking through today is um, an open source project called Metal as a Service that aims to at least provide the data center back end for that. Um, OK, so no manual configuration anywhere. And what we call model-driven operations from the ground up. In other words, to understand what a data center is doing, instead of going and looking at the machines, you go and look at us at a simple kind of schematic, a model effectively, that says, well, I'm running a bunch of big data and a bunch of machine learning, and I've got a container cluster, and I've got a, 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 an OpenStack cluster, or a cloud cluster, or something else like that, right, an Azure stack. And uh, that model should capture everything that you need to know about the state of the data center, or everything should be generated from that model, right? And so that's a nice, clean way to articulate the idea, but in practice, what, is it, what, you know, what does it actually end up looking like? Um, uh, and so let me go to, I think, let me go here to start with. Okay. So MAS, Metal as a Service, is um, essentially a, 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 a regional controller, SQL database backend, that knows about every device in the data center, and, uh, and then a distributed set of relays, which essentially proxy that knowledge into a particular rack or into a particular environment. So architecturally, that enables it to scale quite nicely, because as the data center gets bigger, you have something close to each rack to handle the high-speed traffic required in a particular rack. Um, I can give you a sense of what's going on over here. Um, so in this particular, in this little deployment here, this orange box up front here is uh, 10, we normally talk about 10 nodes, 10 little Intel nooks effectively. And you can see those 
uh, in this listing over here. And there are a couple of nice new little twists to talk about. One of them is this Facebook wedge. Not sure why that network came and went. Um, one of them is the Facebook wedge over there, which is essentially giving me the ability to have all of the switches in the same database. So now I can think about a switch as just another server in the database of what's in the data center. Uh, and here we've got something new, which is the Cavium ThunderX ARM servers, OCP equipment that looks and feels just like standard 2U equipment, IPMI, remote pixie boot, uh, the ability to remote provision an OS. And when you dig into it, that as a server looks just like anything else you might find in the data center, but it happens to be the new ARM64 architecture. So we're sort of consolidating all the complexity and abstracting that down to really just a list of nodes, whether they are switches or, um, uh, or, or, or servers of different classes. Uh, we want to do discovery. So I think what we're going to do is kick off, a, a basically we're going to pretend that we have just bought a new switch or bought a new rack. And so if we just trigger that, it's already, it's already en route. OK, so what we should see, OK, this node just showed up literally in, in the last couple of seconds. That tidy weevil, um, I think, is one of those Facebook's, Facebook wedges. So what I need to do is say, OK, all I know about it is um, uh, that it has showed up once. It's essentially been pixie booted once. I will need, need to do one extra step, which is to go and commission it. And in commissioning, what we do is we disklessly boot that node, whatever it is. So it's diskless. We're not touching the disk effectively. And we can then inspect the hardware and, and detect things like uh, switch ASICs, the amount of RAM, the amount of memory. And so that's how we're effectively um, able to introspect that hardware. Um, OK, so that's what's happening at the, at the top of rack switch. Um, let me just show one other thing. Um, because we are in every rack, we can also scan the network effectively and do that very efficiently just by looking at, at, at ARP traffic that's happening. And so you can start to get a sense of everything that's in the data center that you'd forgotten about, right? All the things that have been attached or someone's assigned an IP address, they happen to be there. Uh, they're there, they work, they're fine, but because somebody's forgotten about them, easily you could end up creating a problem with stomping over IP addresses and everything. So essentially, we're, we're able very cheaply to provide a constant background scan of the network so that we know not just the stuff that's in the model and the stuff that's supposed to be there, the stuff that we put there, but the stuff that happens to be there, whether it's um, DHCP'd or whether it's um, uh, uh, been statically configured effectively and, and happens to be sitting there. And, and in the newest versions of this, we can scan every VLAN all the time effectively. So you can watch the entire network and understand everything that's going on. OK. Um, some of the stuff that's in the pipeline right now, the Intel rack scale stuff, which is pretty amazing. I think they're here on the, on the show floor. The rack scale design idea is essentially that the rack has uh, disaggregated components in it. And so in, a, in an interesting way, you don't actually have any servers until you start constituting servers out of those components. And again, that shows up very nicely in this interface because the, although this looks like a list of nodes, essentially what it is is it's a cloud. I can call into this thing and, and ask for a machine to be, um, to be allocated to me. And with things like rack scale design, those nodes can actually be created on demand. So there isn't a node there until I ask for a node. If I ask for a node with so many disks, then that number of disks are dynamically, effectively attached to, to uh, the, 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 the node that's been constituted. It shows up here and then gets allocated to a workload. Um, uh, obviously, nodes aren't interesting. What's interesting is being able to give them to people and allocate them to workloads. So I don't seem to have the, 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 the BMC network up um, in here, which means that bit is not going to be happy, so I won't go there. Um, but essentially, I can ask for a node and say, put Windows on it, or put RHEL on it, or put Ubuntu on it, and then hand that over to somebody else where they would, they would do their own application configuration. Right? This is just inventorying the data center and driving the data center. OK, so um, uh, since, since the, 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 the 
So everything that I've described has essentially been there for, 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 for a couple of years. What's new there is things like the rack scale design and ARM servers and so on and so forth. But it's always felt like that's kind of solving half the problem, right? We're essentially understanding uh, uh, every uh, machine in the node, inventorying every machine in the rack, and then um, being able to go in and, for example, configure things like uh, you know, the disks, the RAID configuration, the network configuration, and so on. But we're really only describing half the problem because we're describing what we want on the host and assuming that the network effectively um, will match that. Right? So say, for example, you say, look, I, I've got two 25 gig ports on that server. I want to bond those into a 50 gig bonded link. You have to separately go to the switch and make sure that those two ports have been bonded effectively so that everything will come up fine. And the key focus right now is to be able to say, okay, since we're opening up switches, since we're opening up the switches, we should actually be able to run on the switch. And now we can program both halves of the, we, we can take responsibility for both halves of the problem. So that's, that's what's sort of new and exciting. So I wanted to sort of dig into that. Here I'm actually running, um, I'm actually running on this Facebook Wedge 100. And so what's unusual about this MAS deployment over here is that normally we have an 11th Intel Nook at the back which is running MAS, and that essentially acts as the box that's the controller on the, on, on the rack. But here, because the switch is open, we're actually running MAS on the switch itself. And so this um, looks and feels like a normal Ubuntu system. It's just a standard Linux environment, effectively. It's running on the x86 motherboard, effectively, of that uh, uh, Wedge 100 switch from Facebook. And I can... I can show you some of the interesting software that's then running on that. The first piece is MAS itself. So MAS is actually running, all of this interface is running on the switch. So that's quite interesting. Uh, to, today, if I go into a bunch, there are a bunch of people who use MAS at scale, and typically what they'll do is they'll have a rack of 2U servers, and then they'll have a tiny little nook or some other small server that's attached to each rack that's playing the role of that relay. Now with open switches, we can actually move that code onto the top of rack. And so it's really interesting. The top of rack switch is effectively controlling the provisioning of uh, 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 operating systems and inventories and so on like that of the, of, of the rack itself. And here I'm running the whole region effectively, the whole data center, off that, that, that Facebook switch. Um, what else is running there? Um, I'm listing a set of snaps. Snaps are a new package that uh, makes it very, very easy for the publishers of software essentially to distribute software to operating systems like Ubuntu or CentOS. Uh, and the snap that's on here that's uh, really interesting is FlexSwitch. Uh, well, let me start with live patch. So recently, the, the Linux kernel gained the ability to do live patching. So you're running a kernel, there's a security issue with the kernel, normally you would have to reboot the kernel. Uh, because we're running standard Ubuntu on standard x86 now, we can actually use the live patch mechanisms in Ubuntu to live patch the kernel running on the switch. Uh, so I can show you if the network comes back. What that looks like. So here, essentially on the switch, you can see that that kernel has been live patched with all of these CVE vulnerability fixes. And that you can immediately see is useful because you no longer have to worry about security on the switch if the operating system essentially is a standard operating system that you can patch manage or that offers things like um, uh, live patching of the kernel. You, you, the number of reboots you're going to be doing essentially just for security reasons is going to be dramatically reduced. Um, there's another switch here which is interesting, which is flex switch. So this is the snap root L2, L3 control plane stack. That's the startup that's spun out of the Apple data center uh, uh, developer team effectively. And there's a web interface for that. So I can, I can go and have a look at that. So again, this is the snap root uh, uh, control plane, which is just an app sitting on top of the OS effectively uh, on that switch. And uh, you can imagine essentially 
um, uh, uh, using this mechanism to evaluate different switch control planes very, very easily. Um, on this switch, which has been auto-detected, I should be able to Ah, no, I have to commission first. I should be able to go and commission it, and then I can deploy it. And, 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 and the, the, the piece that I wanted to show you that I'm not quite going to be able to show you is that we've configured this Metal as a Service deployment that when it deploys onto a Facebook 40, it will deploy not only Ubuntu, but it will also deploy the Microsoft uh, switch control plane, which is Sonic, so Project Sonic, effectively. And that shows up in exactly the same way, right? That's just a different app, a different snap uh, on top of the switch. So now you can imagine switching between uh, um, uh, Facebook's uh, network control plane, Microsoft's network control plane, the snap root network control plane that's spun out of Apple. All of that innovation from those very, very large scale operators is now easily accessible effectively at the top of rack just by swapping out a package effectively on a standard, on a standard operating system. Uh, there are also snaps of ICOS, which is the, which is the um, uh, Broadcom um, switch control plane, uh, and a couple of others that are in the pipeline as well. So making it really easy to essentially swap out what's running, at the, what's controlling the ASIC effectively at the top of the rack switch. Okay. Um, so lastly, because it's an open device, we also essentially can create a little app store for each for each switch. And so here you can see on that uh, Facebook uh, Wedge 100 effectively, um, uh, the beginnings of an app store for the switch. Um, I'm not going to vouch for the appropriateness of running Hanoi on a switch, or etcd for that matter. But again, the key idea is that now we can start to put applications there alongside the uh, switch control plane app effectively. Um, and we can build an ecosystem of things that talk to each other and provide services down into the rack at line rate, effectively, because they're running right at the top of rack. Okay, so just some final takeaways. The, the, the key thing that I think is, is the challenge for the next um, wave of this is that switches today are often not quite server grade in the way you can operate them. So uh, the, the wedges are really, really great because they have BMCs which means we can remotely um, uh, power them on and off. We can pixie boot them. We can essentially do remote um, OS installs with full control of the wedge in exactly the same way that you might hope to have full control of a physical piece of infrastructure. The other area that's still sort of really nascent is detection of the hardware. Um, a lot of the, because traditionally switches would ship uh, with essentially a fixed firmware blob on them, they, um, uh, they don't do a really great job of, of signaling to something that's running you know, what they are, because it would have been assumed that the software was kind of came part, as part of the package. And in our world, we want to be able to detect automatically anything that's there and automatically know what permutations and combinations are going to work. Right? We want to be able to auto-detect um, which switch control planes are going to work on which switches. So that's, that's just right in the beginning phases now. And then the last piece of, of that story, essentially, is there's still quite, in practice, there's still quite tight coupling of the drivers, effectively, from the various switch ASIC manufacturers with particular builds of the software or versions, revisions of the library. So, you know, depending on the ASIC, um, you'll, you'll find that you have more or less freedom to be able to switch between those switch control applications because sometimes they effectively have to be hard linked against a very specific version of the, of the DLL or the library that will control the, 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 the ASIC. So I'm pretty confident though that all of those things will, will get teased apart, talking to the different switch manufacturers, the guys from Barefoot, um, the guys from uh, obviously Broadcom, Mellanux and so on. I think as we've opened up the box, the opportunity to be able to sort of dynamically offer different software stacks effectively suddenly is real. They, they're getting away from that three-year design cycle and down to a, a much more agile kind of provisioning and, uh, and, and, and iteration-driven life cycle. So that's where we're at. I hope it's useful and uh, look forward to seeing more of you in the community. Thank you.